This is a Touchstone Publishers presentation, your trusted source of leadership knowledge. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I know some of us is, may not seem like morning, but it is morning someplace in the world. So we'll go with that. Good morning. Well, I'm going to have to go because as hard as I tried to pronounce the last name, I'll ask permission. Can I just call you Dr. Nadia? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, and our introduction guy, he had it perfect, but uh, we'll get it for you. So I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. I have to tell you, I usually listen to TED Talks two to three times. Mm -hmm. I had to go back because there was so many, so much powerful information there oh. that uh, I found I can actually use in some of my own teaching out on the road and some of those different things. So I want to just kind of dive into that. But before we get going into that, my traditional first question always is, can you tell us what's unique, powerful, that most people don't really know about your organization or your TED Talk, either one, your organization or your TED Talk, well, what is unique or powerful about that? Oh, that's a tough question. So I had four TEDx talks done in my life. And yeah. what's unique about them is that they all tell one story. And that one story is about how do you increase the level of life in your company, in your system, in your organization, in your own career. They're all about understanding this idea of what it means to be fully alive yeah and we're going to talk about that because how to kill your own company when i first read that title i said well, wait a minute let's jump into that but it's kind of unique but be again before we dive into that what about your journey to your first tedx talk what was that like from the time that you conceived the idea to the time you're on stage taping it what was that journey like i have to admit let's be super honest that was one of the most arrogant moments of my life where I was way too arrogant. So wow. this is the way it happened. I was um, uh, a professor, Coca-Cola chaired professor in the executive education only business school, which meant that I had a lot of chance to speak publicly. Mm. And therefore, the organizer of that TEDx event in Ljubljana, in Slovenia, already knew that they want me speaking. And they just invited me for a coffee. And I didn't know anything about the topic. So I said yes before the topic. And I sit down at the coffee. And they said, well, um, you know, uh, we are happy to have you. And I said, what's the topic? And they said, women. And I said, I have nothing to say about women. And they said, great. Can you do that in 16 minutes? And <laughs> that's, how, that's how that topic, which titled is, uh, I have nothing to say about women is really the first talk. But what was arrogant is I didn't put enough effort into really prepping the story. I didn't understand the lack or the inability to show the visual. I used the visuals quite heavily as a part mm. of the story, but they wouldn't show up on the video the way I imagined them. So there was a lot there that I just didn't do my work. And that seems to be the surprise for a lot of people because it seems like when you have to take your ideal worth spreading, and then move it down to 16 to 18 minutes. That's always difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get to the certain point, you feel like, well, I don't have to memorize this. I can just talk about it. But I think a lot of us are starting to discover, no, if I'm going to do a reasonable TED Talk, I better memorize it word for word, slide for slide, if I'm using slides, presentation. So I'm glad you were honest enough to say, hey, my that arrogance. Was bad. <laughs> that was bad. Yeah. My first TEDx talk was bad. The spirit of the talk was very sweet. And what I was trying to convey was very good. But we have to understand that people have a very short bandwidth right now. And if we want to be valuable, if the goal is not to be on stage with a cool logo and, you know, I'm yeah. this amazing person. But if your goal is to actually move people and create value and give them something meaningful, you have to do a huge effort to be meaningful from moment one before they even click the video. Your title exactly. has to be meaningful. It has to be meaningful in a way that at least it opens up a space for them. It creates an opportunity for them to imagine something different. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell us about your journey, though, from when you conceived the idea of the talk about your um, how to kill your own company. 
Tell us about that journey. How did you get that down into 18 minutes? How did you? So that's my together? fourth talk. So Without by that time, I mm -hmm. had a lot of pluses and minuses. And you can see also in terms of the views, this yes. is the talk where we've surpassed 300,000 views because uh, we were learning from each consecutive talk. So uh, at that point, my research and my uh, consulting, teaching, and entrepreneurial practice as a serial entrepreneur, as a, as a person who starts and exits businesses and so on, I had uh, an idea, I had a thought that for this century, there is one skill that will become the basic literacy skill. So the essence of that talk is this idea that if 100 years ago, reading and writing constituted the basic literacy, what it means to be literate in this century, and reading, writing, and basic arithmetic became the literate person. I mm. believe that this century, if you have no resilience and reinvention, you cannot call yourself literate. Your ability to oh. reinvent your ability to pick up and change as the volatility and disruption is growing. You cannot call yourself literate. So we have this body of knowledge around the idea of reinvention as a management of the life in a system and ability to stay alive and thrive in uncertainty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that comes to my first question that came to my mind when we're listening to this because Things are changing. It is volatile. But why is it that some organizations just refuse to make that change? Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. And the biggest reason, as we were doing our research, we understood that it comes down to the fundamental shift in the way the global human family operates. And that is for a very long period of time, for about 200 years, we lived in an area of relative stability. So if you look at business, for example, the average life cycle of a business model in the 20th century was about 75 years. What does that mean? It means you can make money in about the same way for 75 years right. without needing to change it. And that's why most of our management theory and most of the way we run our organizations and also the most things we teach in basic school is all about stabilization. It's about managing stability and it's about control uh, because that's what you want to do when stability is the key, when that is your ultimate criteria of success. Right, right, now, right. Predictability, reliability, stability, and so on. So most of strategy, most of theory, such as supply chain management, uh, just-in-time management, and so on, most of traditional command and control management is all about stability. And therefore, we have a mindset that doesn't match the reality. We keep using the tools of the old system and old paradigm while the world is no longer there. Because today, the uh, median life cycle of a business model, according to our 2020 research, is just six years. So if before you could do the same thing for 75 years, now you can do it for just a few years before you need to ring that. You know, though, the challenge to me with those statistics is that that's been in place for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. We've been in this situation where things are changing exponentially every year. If you're going to be there, you don't have 75 years. Mm -hmm. The power structure is changing, but we have so much resistance to that. Yeah. Because we're not taking seriously the fundamentals that have to change. So how we teach kids at school has to change. What we do at work has to change. There is a monumental shift happening. It takes time. And 20 years is not that long to transition to a whole new mindset globally. So we are making an effort. And of course, I'm happy to say that Reinvention Academy and my own work is dedicated to that effort and we're mm -hmm. making big movements, but it will take time. Well, you know, I said 20 years, but that's not true. Uh, I point to your story. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tell us about that, the lessons you learned. And give us a little, I know you talked about it in your TEDx, but tell us a little bit about that story mm -hmm. and well, the lessons you learned. It is a story I'm still waking up to. Also because as I was growing up in the Soviet Union, it was not exactly the safest story to tell. So I didn't learn it until the Soviet Union collapsed and I was already 
a mature formed human being. But I was born in the Soviet Union and 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, in the 90s, 20s, early 1930s, the government of Soviet Union engineered an artificial famine that was designed to control population, which killed, in the case of Kazakhstan, my home country, 40% of the entire Kazakh population. And there was recently a, a really touching and really good article in the Wall Street Journal on the forgotten famine of Kazakhstan, because it's generally speaking, not something people talk about genocide 40 percent of the whole population is killed and it just passed by it's not there what happened to me in that context this happened long before i was born mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. my grandparents and my parents were all living in the world preparing their kids consciously or unconsciously to live in a world where this kind of disruption mm -hmm can happen and most likely will happen again. So I had the luxury to get my literacy uh, upgraded for resilience and reinvention long before most of the world did. It's a shame because we've had situations throughout time where genocide is just no more practice. Yeah. Um, and not just in Eastern Europe, but here in the US, we've had genocide where it's just normal and it's okay we want to ignore that and therefore i don't think we're learning the lessons that should be out there mm -hmm. what, what lesson would you tell people you know from that that you personally learned because you mentioned this in your ted talk you mentioned that you know you kind of learned that you have to be resilient you have to mm -hmm. move on what else did you learn from just learning about your grandfather well the most important thing i learned is that i realized that purpose is something so incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, so one thing is, um, I just need to very quickly tell my team that I have a problem with my Mac right here. Okay. <laughs> so that we need to solve this problem. So the most important lesson I learned immediately is the power of purpose. My grandfather was born in a happy family. But his parents, his dad was executed as an enemy of the state because he was vocal against genocide and his mom died immediately after that. And what happened is that he was moved to an orphanage house in a country, Russia, he never visited, to a language he didn't know. And it was so, so important. Uh, it's so important that... Uh, we are figuring out the purpose there. So he lived his whole life without anything real positive of hope mm. happening, but he kept going so that I could live with his last name and do things around the world without ever seeing that realized he actually killed himself in 1975. So I wow. never met wow. him, but he kept going as long as he could so that I could be here, my daughter could be here doing amazing stuff. So this idea that sometimes you have purpose so much bigger than yourself and it drives you forward, even though you won't really see the fruits of your labor, but you keep going, that keeps me going when I feel like, okay, this is not working, I will give up. Well, he didn't give up and here I am. The reason. Yeah. I, if I was him, I probably would give up at 20 and say, I'm done with this life. But he kept trying. And that was a, an incredibly important purpose. Just keep trying with massive action. So such a great lesson. You know, and I also loved in your TED Talk how you took the analogy of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed how you broke it down. So I want you to tell us about the different parts. Let's start off with the binoculars. Let's talk about that. And yeah. why you, what that really means. Yeah. So um, when I started researching, so let me back up. I was okay. born in the environment I was born. I went to do a doctorate specifically in organizational behavior, studying large systems change and large system survival. And I started noticing that I see parallels between the companies killing themselves and whole communities like the former Soviet Union destroying itself. And I wanted to understand how do we prevent that? because I've lived through a collapse of the country. I know how easily it can happen. You think you're unsinkable. You think you're untouchable. You think nothing can happen. No, it can happen and things are 
very fragile. So the question becomes, how do we prevent this from happening? And that was my driving question. And as I started researching companies that survive disruption and what separates them from companies that do not, there's mm -hmm. this list of characteristics. And as I was looking at those stories and cases, it reminded me of a story of Titanic that I heard from a wonderful Spanish professor, Juan Serrano, this parallel between what happened on Titanic and what happened in business. So right. my human eyes sat down and started researching and pulled the historical documents and read the regional investigation reports and Senate hearings and all of that. Yes. One of those stories was the story of binoculars. So at the moment of collision, Titanic had amazing technology and of course they had binoculars on board but the people who were responsible for noticing the possible threat noticing the iceberg did not have them in their hands there's two people called lookouts who work in this kind of open air cubicle called crow's nest mm -hmm. had a lot of skills in their hands and they were dedicated and motivated and loyal and all of that but they didn't have binoculars and why didn't they have binoculars because they were locked up. The person who had the key was let go at the first stop of Titanic in Belfast. And that key was later sold at the auction as a key that killed the Titanic. So here's a few layers. Number one is, do you mm -hmm. have what's necessary to notice the trends, to notice the incoming disruption? Number two, do you have the people who have tacit knowledge that you may not recognize and you're letting them go or you are not treating them with the right respect and care until it's too late and you don't have that valuable knowledge anymore. And mm. number three, what's up with that mindset of arrogance? This was not a safe, it was a cupboard. It could have been broken, but nobody wanted to break it because there was this arrogance and overconfidence that this will not happen to us. This can never happen to us. So this okay. becomes a crucial issue. The crucial issue that there are multiple layers of the story that have to be solved so that they are working. Well, address for us real quick the idea of, I think it's arrogance as well, when you don't go to your team to get answers because maybe you think you know them all. How do you solve that issue in culture today? How would you, when you're coaching people or coaching teams, how do you solve that issue? Well, I also have that issue myself, right? So... Uh, every now and then at a team meeting, I sit there and I'm like, I've done this a hundred times, guys, we will do it this way. And thankfully, uh, I have a young team around me that has enough knowledge about Titanic syndrome to say, hey, this smells like Titanic syndrome. <laughs> Check yourself. Right. So number one is having the culture of psychological safety. So when they say that, they don't get punished. They don't get any retribution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's not treated as a disrespect. Okay. So let me make, because what I like to do every now and then is just say, this is a writable moment. Let's write this down. Let's not tweet it. Let's write it down. And the writable moment I think I just got from you is it must be a culture where people feel treated fairly mm -hmm. and they feel like they're not going to get punished for giving a different ideal than the boss or the leader of the group. So this is very, very important that there is no retribution, direct or indirect for disagreement. And there are things you can say and show uh, to keep driving that down. So recently, we just recorded a short video that if uh, in businesses in life, if two people always agree, one of them is unnecessary. If two people always agree, one of them is unnecessary. That has been Very a true. saying in our company yeah. for a long time, that if you all agree, why do we need the difference of opinions? The, the, if we can't discuss it, if we don't feel that it's even, you're not gonna, there's not going to be any retribution. But if you both agree, then I don't need you to agree with me. <laughs> then I can talk to myself. Why are we having yeah. a meeting? So the whole idea of really rewarding in words, in actions, including the fact that after they say to me that it smells like Titanic syndrome, I change my behavior. So they know that there is... Uh, there is a benefit of them saying it. It's not just they voiced it, but nothing changed. So um, there are mm. many different things you can do. We've developed this tool called Titanic Syndrome Test. It's a free tool you can download um, and just run in your company. 
And we try to do it on a regular basis. So every couple of months, we all take a test and we compare it and see dynamics and have a conversation on whether or not we are showing the signs. Uh, and here's, thank you so much uh, for the link. So you can download the handbook, get the test, read the cases and see if this is showing some signs in your organization. And the good thing about this test, it's not only a diagnostic, it's, it's a prescriptive. Every wow. item on those 15 items is a suggestion of what exactly you can do to fix that. So we designed it not only to be a diagnostic, but give you a specific prescription of what you can do to improve the situation. To improve your vision. Yes. Okay. To, improve, to have better yeah. binoculars, binoculars so that you can address the incoming iceberg or storm or tsunami. You know, um, a while back, I think it was... I don't remember the name of the company, but they always said customer is always first, customer is always right. And you were able to show how, well, tell us about that. And I think yeah. you just, I think you let it, let everybody know that's not necessarily truthful. It's not necessarily truthful because there is a multiple layers of stakeholders in any situation. And all of those stakeholders have to be in a win-win. And I think we often create value for one stakeholder, let's say your customer, at the expense of another, for example, your employee. And the a situation where we have companies with people working below living wage is a typical example of a value created for the customer at the expense of employees. And in reality, mm. there is no value. It's a plus minus equals zero, even a minus. So this balance of value for different stakeholders is crucial. And Titanic mm. is again showing that uh, because it was a very disbalanced story. And that's a story of radio operators. So Titanic had one of the best radio equipment at that yeah. point on the planet. Right. And their radio operators were very loyal and engaged and dedicated. They were not at all bad employees. And what were they so engaged in? They were sending messages for first class passengers so there's actual historical records of passing ships who are trying to warn titanic that there is much more ice than expected by everyone that it's mm. not just a little bit of ice that this is really radically different situation and there's much more ice on their road, right, right. on their way and the radio operators and i quote say back shut up get off my frequency, I'm passing messages for first class passengers, which is an idea that you are serving your customer. But are you? Because your customer is not just a first class passenger, it's also all other classes. And also you have stakeholders called employees, their families, um, shareholders, and so on. So you cannot put safety against the convenience of radio uh, message, even though right. those messages could be important, but when I read those messages, hardly any of them was actually super meaningful. They were more like order flowers for lunch. So this is an example where we have a misunderstanding of what is the value we're creating and who are we responsible to when creating value. Would you say, though, that misunderstanding started maybe at what I would call the mission that's been reported from the top stakeholders down here's the mission of the radio room i think it's all around so okay. sometimes it is top down sometimes it's also self-agency when we don't have clear communication we make a story in our head or what mm. important and what's not important and we need a system that corrects us if my interpretation of what's important here what's the mission is incorrect there should be enough signals from the system from my co colleagues from my bosses from my um, customers from my suppliers that say hey you're of course here and there has to be a culture in which there is a lot of checks and balances around our potential misunderstandings and in this case everything in the system was working towards this idea of we are untouchable, we are unsinkable. And that's why I call it Titanic syndrome, this idea of a syndrome being many different manifestations of a fundamental cause or fundamental root cause of a problem. We're going to, uh, for lack of a better word, have a difference of opinion here because you said it's from every place. It mm -hmm. comes from all angles. 
But I'm wondering, because that Titanic syndrome in my mind seems like, when I listen to the story about it, it seems like it starts really at the top. It's that expert, it's that leader who's saying, okay, we're unsinkable. So mm -hmm. pay attention to the first class customers, make sure they have a, make sure they have no issues. Mm -hmm. We're unsinkable, so we don't really need, and you talked about him in the TED talk, that expert who was sitting at home, who mm -hmm. had the key for the black mm -hmm. We're unsinkable, we don't need to break in to get those out. And that all seems to come from the top, mm -hmm. from the experts at the top. You would tend to disagree with that though, I think it sounds like. It's more that I have enough faith and also enough practice where we can correct that kind of top-down approach from middle or even the bottom. We have worked with companies around the world where a change has been driven from all over the world, from all over the levels in the company. So mm. is it necessary to always stop on top? It's easier but it's not necessary. Is it much easier? Yeah, absolutely. But is it necessary? No, we've had situations in our projects around very different parts of the world, very different industries, very different companies, sizes, and so on, okay. where we were able to bring change at different levels and create leadership at every level. And I think that's the goal right now. In a place where things are very volatile, and things are very fast moving. You cannot wait for the top to make up their mind. You need to have leadership at every level. And that's my goal in creating resilient organizations. Okay. So now this is where the danger of what I said is in place. And I find this story to be just absolutely, this is the third of the three, mm -hmm. these experts that were there involved in this. And you talk about one expert Tell us about that. Then I have a question with that one. Well, first officer Murdoch was the expert and he was by any means, but everything I read about him, every testimony, he was a remarkable man. I mean, it's a tragic, tragic story by every mean. He was truly in every way, not only an expert in terms of his uh, skills in navigating the waters, but also as human being, he, he really was saving people to the last moment he did not survive but what um what i believe happened is that his best practices his past success mm -hmm. was part of the reason why the ship went through the routine uh, that it went because first officer murdoch was very known in the industry for one thing and that thing was navigating and preventing potential collisions there's a very famous story of him on another ship called arabic where he was able to prevent a collision in just inches away from another ship and he mm. did this uh in a very very calm and ease state of mind so what i understand from the analysis of the experts in the navigation theory is that he did everything he could to save the ship what he didn't take into consideration is a fundamentally different construction with those watertight walls that prevented the ship uh, from sinking in one situation. But that meant if you cut horizontally against them and most of them are damaged, the ship cannot be saved. And some experts today say that if he was just not touching the wheel and he would just allow the ship to hit the iceberg more straight on, it would be damaged, but it would not sink, which is to say he applied his best practice. He mm -hmm. used his own past success, but the conditions were different. And what saves you two years ago could be exactly what kills you today because the world is now volatile, uncertain, and moving very fast. So that's same with my, my own experience and experience with companies with work. What was the winning strategy just half a year ago could be exactly what's destroying you today. So we have to be willing to let go of our own best practices. We have to be excellent at unlearning, not just learning. And that's tough. I, yes. I have to say from my own experience, that's yes. very, very hard to give up your learning, to give up your best practice, to be, give up your expertise. That's very, very hard. Was there any, and this is my question for you, was there any evidence that he was being told, don't do it this way by somebody who maybe didn't have the experience? Somebody said, you know, we're constructed different. No, he... it was very quick. So he moved very quick and it was a almost a, a, an automatic reaction. And it, it he just gave the set of orders immediately as um, the news were coming in and as soon as they hit the iceberg. So there was no 
time or place for anyone to interfere. It was a very, very quick reaction, which is to a degree what's happening now. We have such quick situations on the market that we have very little room to explore. But it is, again, a reminder that reinvention is not a one-time project. It's not like we can set up a project and put all controls in. It has to become a mindset. It has to become an upgraded tool set and it has to become a skill set that is nearly mm -hmm. automatic so that you have uh, a, a neural system and the organizational yeah. system that reacts when the things happen in a way that prevents this kind of tragedy. Well, see now, this still goes back now to my initial question of you. The stakeholders, the leaders, I mean, wasn't there anybody that went to this, uh, this gentleman and said, hey, this boat's constructed differently? I'm sure they said it many times. Um, same as I've been speaking about business cycle since 2013, which is now, what, uh, seven, eight years. Um, uh, it's yeah. one thing to understand it intellectually. It's a different thing to understand it in terms of rethinking and redesigning your fundamental systems. I'll tell you uh, an example, budgeting. Uh, when we are living in a very stable world, annual budget is a great idea. It uh, is a way to have solid predictions based on past data. It's a way to co-direct and align the entire team. Mm -hmm. It's a way to have a step-by-step -step plan towards your strategic goal. Great idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. works wonderfully when the world is stable. But when the inflation is up and down, conditions on the market change weekly, the currency exchange or supplier expectations or closing or what's happening right now with supply chains in China and goods are not appearing on time, your annual budget can be killing you every day. But right, right. how many companies have a dynamic budget that is not annual, that is rolling and is acting more as a forecast than the traditional command and control budget that is updated on a weekly or monthly basis and looking forward yeah. not backwards almost none <laughs> so you see i've been talking about this for eight years intellectually we understand it well that's a really good point if you think about it i mean things are changing enough i mean i just i know nothing about bitcoin but just watching how that's starting to affect even my line of work, people want to pay me with bitcoins. I don't know what that is. Forget that. <laughs> but, you know, but that's we have to get dynamic like that. And when you say a monthly budget or a yearly budget, that's in a command and control sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that could be part of the issue with some of this five, six year success. Mm -hmm. Five or six years before things change. That's exactly what's happening with businesses right now. Intellectually, um, First Officer Murdoch probably understood that the ship is different, but our nervous system, especially when we go away from the new part of our nervous system, the prefrontal cortex, and go to more old structure, older structures in our brain, they are incredibly faster than our intellectual self. I always yeah. use this example. Yeah, yeah. All of us are drivers. Remember the last time you were sitting in a passenger seat and the driver was doing something crazy? Your foot was pushing the imaginary pedal. It does that for me. I do that. You are a smart person. I'm a smart person. Intellectually, I know there's no pedal there. I, when I sat down in the car, I my eyes recognized there is no pedal. brake yeah. there. There's no pedal. But your brain is so much slower than the rest, the, the newer cortex, the newest part of your brain is so much slower than the rest of your body that it acts immediately. And that's why we have to bring reinvention and resilience to the level of automated response so that we don't have time to um, knock ourselves down and shut down our own protective mechanism. Well, maybe that's a good case for why people should uh, train. I mean, look at the airline pilots. You know, they're in training every six months and maybe that's not enough. I mean, but you know, that's more than the leadership folks, you know, here's, sure. here's a new thing. I mean, I should be taking For a class. Sure. Yeah. I should when be taking was a class the last time, yeah. When was the last time you were at the rehearsal meeting? Not the real meeting, but the meeting where we're just rehearsing how to meet. It's assumed that we meet with new people. And from moment one, we know how to work together. No, we don't. We no. need to rehearse. We need to train. We need to train. Yep. And instead of fighting it, we just need to train with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to ask you, 
Now you said this in your TED Talk a little bit, but I want you to give us a little bit more detail. What's killing most companies now? Not understanding when to reinvent, assuming you have time. Um, oh, wait a minute, though. You just yeah. said assuming you have time. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something you should be making time for? Uh, you need to make time, but you assume that you can do it tomorrow. So assuming that you have another day, assuming that things are slower than they are, assuming that you still have a little bit of time before you need to make a move. I think that's uh, one of the biggest reasons why companies are dying today. Hmm. Arrogance, absolutely. Titanic syndrome, absolutely. It's happening. Um, inability to notice the new incoming reality and having enough skills and systems to adapt to it quickly. But it all comes down to this idea. You still think you have time. And you don't. You don't. You don't, because things are changing so quickly. I took note of this and make sure that I brought this up. You did some research where you discovered how much time is taking place, how much change, excuse me, is taking place on a yearly basis. I think you did it yearly and did it quarterly. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's a lot of different data. So uh, I can keep going in different directions, but we have humongous changes happening technologically, organizationally, politically, socially, and otherwise, mm -hmm. including how many crises happen in a short period of time. So just on things that people mostly pay attention to, like the economic recessions. We have an economic recession happening somewhere around the world about every 25 days, which means you need to live in a world where you are assuming, you're working with the assumption that it's disrupted every single day. And thriving in disruption is a very different type of life and business and career and mindset than assuming that you can weather the storm until the disruption is over. It will never be over. You know, here's a challenge, unfair. As a university professor, how do you handle disruption? How do I handle disruption? Yeah, well, your team, not just you, but your team. Well, number one is I quit traditional academia. That was number one decision. Okay. And we created okay. our own reinvention academy that is much more the intersection of real business and academia. So a lot of people who do research with us are actually practicing business owners or managers mm. or consultants, those three groups. Okay. So we blend between the research and the real world. Number two is we don't allow ourselves to get very comfortable. So we have a schedule built, a system of self-disruption. We disrupt ourselves before somebody else will. Our sprint uh, length is three months. So every three months, uh, we get rid of products that no longer serve our community. We start new things. And it is a system. It's a process. Change is not a project. It's definitely a process. That leads to really kind of a critical question because you did this TED talk a while back but how are you helping people right now what are you doing to make a difference right now number one thing for me right now is to develop very different ways to teach people reinvention quickly and at scale reinvention academy has only one mission we want 1 billion people with strong resilience and reinvention skills and that means we need to teach we need to figure out and learn how to teach reinvention at scale, how to bring it mm. to mass amount of people. So next time, which can be tomorrow, next time disruption strikes, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's economic crisis, whether it's political unrest, whether it's supplier disruption, customer deselection, or whatever else is disrupting, new competitor, new boss, that you are not knocked off your field, but you use that disruption as an opportunity, not as a threat. And that is number one agenda for us, to give reinvention skills to 1 billion people around the world and to learn how to teach people at large scale. We're already able to do it at thousands at a time. We need to learn how to do it at millions at a time. And that's our goal right now. Wow, wow. Tell us a little bit about the book. This is a collective effort. This is a, another example of how we're disrupting the industry. So instead of going the traditional publishing route, we crowdsourced the book, tested all the tools with about 5,000, 4-something thousand people around the world, uh, updated the tools on a regular basis, and brought this on the market from the moment we started writing 
to the moment we send it to print was three months. Traditional book usually takes about two years. Yeah. And this is a tool kit. This is a handbook that you are meant to use for years and years and years. This is not only one of those books that is trending one day and it's gone. There's nine tools there going from testing your organization and doing the diagnosis all the way to building a more adaptive type of strategies. So strategic planning that is very adaptive, that is not static and all kinds of tools in between. And I'm very delighted if you guys download the 85 page free preview and give us some feedback on how those tools work for you. Okay. Now I want to ask you just a little bit about the um, process and that number one thing hits me in my mind to say, okay, how are you testing people? What's your uh, process for testing? You don't have to give away the full boat now, but if I'm going to go download this, I want to know how are you testing my company? Well, we do a lot of different ways of testing. And of course, we test also the tools, which means we give the tools away for free to a very diverse group of people, a representative sample from different industries, sizes, regions, because there's a lot of regional difference. And we help people utilize the tools and then collect data on the impact to see if the tools is working mm -hmm. or if it needs to have an upgrade. For example, the tool that is in this free preview that you see the link on the page right now called Stellar Strategy Canvas, that canvas is on version 13 right now. We've upgraded it and improved it based on the feedback nonstop so that it can be used uh, across different industries in very different situations and still be useful. Wow, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. You know, doing you've done four, so it's kind of not a fair question, but how did this TEDx talk? How did this TEDx talk change your life and or your business? Hmm. Well, I think uh, uh, there's some some great writer who once said that I could have I could have written you a short letter, but I had no time, so I'm writing you a long one. This idea of condensing everything to the essence is a crucial exercise uh, that I loved. For example, the title of this talk, we had 30 plus titles that we were working with and testing again with our community to see which one touches the heart the fastest. So there's an immediate reaction to the name. So just learning how to go back to the essentials, mm -hmm. how to become super clear and super focused was a crucial, crucial exercise. And also just the humbling experience of finally giving it respect it deserves uh, from the very first TEDx talk where I was quite arrogant to the last one where this was a very humbling, and very honest experience. Um, it was a great journey. You know, I want to ask, I have going to hold off on my last question for you because you brought up something there and you talked about it in your TEDx about this idea of arrogance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. How do you take care of that? I mean, even after all this time, I'm sure you, you say it happens, but I'm sure it's still every now and then you got to catch yourself. How would you coach me to say, Glenn, catch your arrogance? Uh, the most important thing is surround yourself with people who can tell you the truth. I think that's the easiest mechanism at this point. Um, it's, it's very tempting to surround yourself with people who will say, yes, ma'am. Um, it's easy in the moment. Um, and it's okay. easy to uh, substitute that or um, accidentally misplace that uh, with the idea that you're working with like-minded people. Like-minded oh. people have common principles, but they are quite open and direct in uh, being able to disagree on specific ideas. So not being not attacking the person but being ruthless when it comes to ideas is a is a practice that achieved better when you're surrounding yourself with people who are not afraid to tell you the truth so that's number one but number two arrogance is fear it's just a, an attempt to cover up your own fear yeah. so coming back to the questions around what is this fear trying to tell you? Fear is a beautiful, underappreciated emotion. It's trying to protect you. What is this fear about? What are you afraid of? That you need to go so far as showing it up as arrogance. That you are so under the influence of fear that you are pretending mm. to know it all. What is this fear trying to tell you? Because fear is always about your body's immune system trying to focus you 
trying to pay how we pay attention. So my question is, what is your fear trying to tell you? It's it's trying to protect you. It's trying to be your friend. Make it your friend rather than run away from it by putting on this fake masks of arrogance. You know, that runs two ways, doesn't it? I mean, understand the fear myself, but understand if I'm working with somebody and they're arrogant, it's fear. It's fear. Hmm, okay. Fear, arrogance is always fear cover up. The person who is not afraid doesn't need to put anyone down or elevate themselves. It's unnecessary. Yeah, it is. It really is. It really is. So my last question is maybe, I hope always to be the hardest question of the day. Yes. Um, and I'm not going to let you off the hook, but here's my last question to you. What is a question that I should have asked you that I did not ask you? It's the question that you should have asked me. Why reinvention? Why okay. why this one? Why why this? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Okay, great okay. question. So let me ask you: Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you reinventing? Um, and you kind of already said it when you sat down and did 13 different iterations of the handbook. You know, why are you reinventing? Why are you going through all this work? I'm studying only one thing. My life is about one thing, life itself. I want to treat life the way we treat currency, the way we treat any other resources. Mm. Life doesn't happen on its own. It's a resource. It's a form of resource. It's a form of capital. And I want us to start treating it with the respect it deserves. Because if we don't, life disappears. It leaves your company. It leaves your product. It leaves your brand. You all know lifeless brands. You come and there is no life there. So the question is, how do we give life respect it deserves and start treating it with the care it needs to? And reinvention is the art and science of bringing the level of life and managing the level of life in your system. So I want mm. to be more alive. That's very simple. I want a world where we are all more alive and there's amazing level of life in everything we do. Amazing level of life, which equals less fear. Yes. I like that a lot. I want to thank you for taking the time. I want to also, we're going to sign off, but I want to have you hold on for just a quick second after we sign off. Ladies and gentlemen, if you really did enjoy this like I did, please go ahead and put like on if you're on YouTube or if you're part of the Facebook group or LinkedIn, wherever you look at this, just let us know that you appreciate the conversation because this is one of those great conversations that take place. So hope to see you folks real soon. Hang in there for me for just one moment. Thank you for connecting with us here at Touchstone Publishers. Please join our group Essential Leadership Skills and share your leadership knowledge with us all.